it doesn't take a genius to work out that your 18 to 30 age group will be your 30 to 45 age group in in a decade's time and so on so you've got to get it right now you've got to engage you've got to be seen as as leading on these subjects rather than following actually by creating solutions that are different and are interesting that can involve some things that actually you can point to and say that's real we are creating new products like the burger i talked about earlier that demonstrate that there is a practical application of your sustainability agenda rather than just greenwash or having some policy in the cloud that's very hard to nail down exactly what it is. Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. A big thank you to BizSimply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. BizSimply is the all-in-one HR workforce management Rotan operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, how we grow our businesses to how we serve our customers. Together we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long term, not just survive. In this week's conversation, I have a very special guest for you. It's Jonathan Davis, who is the MD for Levy UK. And they are the largest UK event catering company and hospitality partner to many of UK's iconic sports, leisure, heritage, conference and exhibition centers. And we start the conversation about talking about the role they play as a business, not only making sure they are financially sound business, but also the importance of them making a positive impact on people, communities, and the planet. And John shares how they are in practice working with food waste throughout their supply chain in their operations and with suppliers. He underlines that This should be the starting point for all operators due to the net impact it will have on their bottom line, but also the huge impact it has on the planet. He explains how they are focusing on measuring where waste is going so you can change habits throughout your operation. We discuss the importance of reducing meat consumption and the importance of being seasonal and the responsibility Libby has towards getting the planet on an even keel. John shares how customers are now demanding that you as an operator can guarantee the right approach to sustainability and technology if you want to win contracts. Along the way, we also talk about changing chef's mindsets around produce and its impact on the planet, how to reuse waste products in the operation, consumers' demands to menus becoming more planet-friendly, the learnings John has had making the business more sustainable, and much more. Before you tune in, please participate in our survey that we are doing with our partner, Biz Simply. Our aim is to understand how leaders in the industry are transforming their organizations to deliver the experience both employees and customers are demanding now. To say thank you for participating, we'll not only give you a free copy of the final report, but you will also be invited to our launch event. Link are in the show notes. But now, please grab a coffee, notebook, and let's get started making the planet a better place. I'm super excited to welcome you to today's episode because we're going to be talking with a part of hospitality that we might not have heard much from in the, in the last couple of, you know, 14 months we're into now. We're going to be talking with uh, John Davids from uh, Levy UK, who is the MD there. And we're going to be talking a bit about, you know, where where they are now from an events catering point of view. But we're also going to be talking about what is it that you as an operator need to look at as we go forward. Actually, how do we actually build a business that's not only focusing on profitability, but also a positive impact it can make on its people, communities, and the planet. And with that said, welcome to the show, John. I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Hi, Michael. Uh, delighted to be here. Thank you for the invite. And, and likewise, uh, looking forward to our conversation. So, John, I mentioned that you from from Levy. For people that haven't heard about Levy and don't know who, who you are and actually that you're part of Compass Group, can you give like a short, maybe a elevator pitch on who you are, what your role is and what roles Levy is in when it comes to catering? Yeah, at Levy UK, 
is a division of Compass. Compass are the world's largest contract caterer. Uh, in Levy, we focus specifically on event catering, um, large scale uh, events and venues. So we operate at a number of uh, premiership football clubs, um, live music. So the O2 Arena, for example, would be one of our major clients. We have rugby stadiums, cricket stadiums, horse racing, as well as large scale conference centers um, uh, and exhibition centers. So we're, we're a commercial company, uh, high volume events, um, and, and obviously being fairly seriously affected by the pandemic because we haven't, we haven't traded in any essence for the last uh, 14 months. Is that uh, still the same, John? That I are you are you slowly coming back as the rest of the world is going through our steps? And today is, uh, as we record, the uh, hospitality open for indoor dining, which is a massive step from a from a capacity and revenue point of view for them. Are you are you seeing the same kind of opening happening around with events and stadiums and so on? You know, this is quite a timely conversation because we are we are slowly coming back to life. It feels like we've been. Um, dormant for a long period of time we've been very busy but um, essentially in terms of actually putting large-scale events on um, it has been uh, a long long period of time Cheltenham Festival uh, back in March last year 2020 was our last last major event that was fully attended but just last week we had uh, people in at the Brits at Brit Awards at the O2 um, four and a half thousand people attended that so that was the largest indoor event uh, to date And this week, as you say, with hospitality reopening in the UK indoors, um, we do have some football games going ahead with fans, uh, a rugby game going ahead with fans. Um, and and that every week that goes by from this point onwards, as long as we control the cases, continue successful rollout with the vaccination program, we we have really positive hopes for, for the summer ahead. That's great news. That's great news, John. The, the reason actually why we uh, intended to set out to talk about was, as I said in the beginning, was talking about, you know, businesses that do merely more than just creating a profit. They also use, you know, their profit, their resources to actually make an impact on people, communities and the planet. Can you tell me a bit more about why you think that's so critical and you as an organization think that's so critical right now uh, as we are in the middle of a crisis, an existence crisis? Over the years, it's become more and more important to me. It's always been at the back of my mind. Um, so when I got into the position of manager director of Levy, I wanted to create um, a vision of how we could go forward with a sustainable platform because I think there's a lot of people out there that think sustainability comes at a price that will kill the commercial model of a hospitality business that can't be achieved, that we can't we can't do all of the objectives that we have um, commercially as well as being as sustainable as, as we could potentially be. And and I really want to challenge that. I want I want to you know be brave in that sphere and actually create solutions um, that that are essentially going to the heart of the problem. That we're the we are the world's largest contract caterer, as I said. I'm the MD of the of the UK's largest event caterer. We have to show that it's possible to change. We have to show that we can look at our supply chain, the way we compose our menu cycles, the way we deal with food waste in a much more proactive way to show that there is hope um, because because we can't give up and just say, well, it is what it is. Um, let's run the clock out. I do genuinely believe that we can be positive and do things in a different way and and not kill the commercial P&L because all of these things can be achieved and we have customers and clients that are crying out for it. So if we don't react and we don't change our behaviors, Actually, the younger generation and and and, and increasingly all generations are asking us um, not just what our CSR policy is or, or do we recycle our coffee cups, but actually what is your holistic policy around food in general? How are you how are you helping to address this crisis, and how can we make a change with you? Also, uh, as you've gone through the, the last fourteen months, I guess you've also been busy trying to figure out how you practical implement some of these things. Because it's all it's been a moment for all of us to, to rethink, you know, everything in life from A to Z. And one of the things you said was like food waste, which has been on the agenda for some years. And but now it seems like, uh, you know, we we need to do something quicker than than we ever could. What are you doing uh, within Levy to address this challenge? Because you know, food waste, you know, in the scales you're running, I I, I couldn't even imagine how many numbers you're on a full volume when you're back up and running plates of food you're serving every weekend or every week. I guess there's some significant initiative that needs to be put in place actually to to reduce things like that. 
yeah, it's millions of meals. I mean, pre-pandemic, we were, you know, our turnover in the UK just for Leave UK was was over 300 million. So we, we're a large company. And that's what attracts me um, to, to be in this position because any change we make has a wider impact. It's the way I look at it is, you know, we can lead, but actually have a massive impact through our scale and ambition. In terms of food waste, Michael, I mean, Again, referring back to the commerciality point, every operator in hospitality should be on, focused on food waste because that has a net effect on your bottom line. The more you control food waste, the more profitable you'll be. It's the, it's the easiest one to tackle almost of the whole sustainability agenda. And I think it's the one that operators get when you talk to them about it because any, you know, any food that you're throwing away clearly is having a massive impact in terms of carbon footprint, but is also physically costing you money. Um, so the control of food waste has, has a double whammy from that, from that impact. I think what we're looking at is how we purchase our food. So if you go right the way through the supply chain, in terms of food waste, how we actually purchase, for example, our meat. You know, most we've got into this habit uh, across hospitality of buying pre-portioned, vacuum-packed portions of meat actually very wasteful for the the actual producer of that animal the farmer um, because you know if we go into a big event and we say we want a thousand rump of lamb well the farmer's got a thousand other cuts from that same animal that he then needs to find a use for so we we've, we've become a lot more in tune to the idea of full carcass usage to getting our chefs to look at actually okay how do we if we're buying a broiler chicken um, and we did this at Wimbledon a couple of years ago, where we looked at we were we were buying free range Sutton Hue, Sutton Hoo chicken, but the entire bird. We were then using the breast meat for hospitality and our hospitality guests, the most premium experience. But then we were looking at the legs um, and the wings for a more retail product, as in let's make a chicken burger from the thighs of that of that chicken. Let's use the wings as a as a snacking retail product and actually develop that whole process so you're not there's no waste happening on the producer end in terms of actually controlling waste when we're serving it um, a lot of our industry has been obsessed with the idea that counters always have to be full buffets always have to be full you have to replenish as you're in the event what we've talked about line venue portfolio is our is our events arm that sells in the in the conference and event space actually talk to your customers explain the nature of that waste that no we're not necessarily if we're doing a lunch event we're not going to do a full replenishment of all the food at one o'clock, quarter past one, because a lot of that's going to go in the bin. A lot of that is going to be wasted. And, and if it's been out ambiently for a period of time, high risk products, we can't reuse them. I think people have this fallacy that we can take, um, you know, a high risk product and, and give it away for to free to someone. Well, not if, not, if, not if it's going to kill someone. We're going to have to, you know, we have to control, we have to control what's actually put, put out in the first place, actually rationalize the amount of dishes and the display of those dishes as an event goes on and actually be really honest that this fear of running out, as we call it, needs to be addressed both from the, the, the event host and the consumer side, as well as us as, as, as a hospitality professionals. You know, it was always instilled in me for many years, you know, make sure everything looks full and abundant, but not taking into, into the impact that at the end of the event, um, things can be thrown away. There is always going to be an element of waste. So then if it is, if it is food that can be, is packaged and is safe. We work with organizations like City Harvest where that is going out to charitable aims. So there is there is always that aspect, but it's not as big as people think because of the because of the issues that I've already highlighted. So actually just simply measuring the amount of waste that you are, you know, you are putting in the bin on a daily basis across all of our kitchens focus the minds a lot more to say, okay, I want to see a KPI improvement on the on the on the per kilo amount you're wasting on a week by week basis across our kitchens. And then actually as understanding that, you know, if we, we can also look at where that waste is going and, and to reuse it again, we've got an exciting project with, um, with working with an academic, Dr. Vincent Walsh at the moment about circular food systems. And we're, we're trying to get to the point where, for example, we could take our coffee waste, um, and grow oyster mushrooms on that coffee waste and then use those oyster mushrooms back in a product that we serve to our consumers. So we've got, you know, and this is in early stages of development, but ultimately you can use oyster mushrooms. It's quite a, you know, it's a good substrate to actually create a new product. And we're trialing at the moment a 50-50 burger, which is 50% beef, 50% mushroom, which is a very good way of essentially what we've promised you know, a couple of years ago, which was to, cut, to halve the amount of beef we're consuming as a business. 
So if we can still sell a really good quality burger that tastes and look like looks like a beef burger, but actually it's 50% mushroom and it's British mushrooms, and ideally they're mushrooms that have been grown from a waste product that's in our business, then then we start to talk about innovation and proper circular food economy that, that it has got a big impact. And, and it, that's what excites me. That, that starts to feel very different. Yeah, and it's funny you say that the food waste, it should be already be something that any operator are, are looking at and really are on top of uh, as soon as it moves anywhere. What, what KPIs have you put in place to actually to measure that you're moving the needle on this and do you have like an overall goal you want to achieve when it comes to especially food waste because i totally agree with you this is the the low-hanging fruit when you talk about environmental impact you can do but there's so much to get done within that if you start putting down all the activities you can look at from purchasing to you know what you throw out in the bin in the end of the day but what, what how do you actually measure success and do you have like a clear goal for the next 10 years what you want to achieve as an organization it's how we measure our own business units. You know, when we go into a business review at our venues, what questions do you ask? And we take a balanced scorecard approach, which is partly finance, partly customer base, partly around health and safety and policies and procedures. And what we've done is we've embedded food waste control and measurement within that balanced scorecard approach. So our unit managers, our venue directors, and our clients can clearly see that we're, we're using that metric as a very important guideline. It's not just about sales growth. It's not just about how we're delivering profitability. It's it's how we get there and, and the measurement there, there thereabouts within. We Before the pandemic, we set some fairly ambitious targets for every venue to, to cut the food waste metric by 20 to 25%. Obviously, that's been it, it ended up getting cut by 100% because no one was open for, <laughs> for 12 months. Um, and now as we relife, we're putting those metrics back in place. We want to see continuous improvement. So every venue is slightly different. It has a slightly different menu mix. We're not a high street chain with the same menu and the same approach and the same sort of footprint. So one stadium could be very different to a live music arena, for example, in terms of the menu content and the volume and the number of shows. So we have to allow some flex in the measurement, but ultimately everyone has to report now on the kilos of food waste that their venue is 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 outputting, if you like, and there has to be a continually continuous improvement by volume of business. So if the set, you know, it has to be judged against the sale volumes that are going through that venue as well. I love data when it comes to, to anything to see if you're winning the game. Are you using any kind of technology to, to help the operation to, to actually get a grip on this and understand what they use on a, on a daily level and what the consequence of their behaviors is in, in, in essence? Yeah, I mean, the parent co- where my parent company, Compass Group, you know, they were an early adopter of Winnow and, and the systems that they they approach. Um, I think that system's come a long way from, you know, being essentially a kitchen scale at one stage to having cameras and technology uh, behind it. We've, you know, we've put that into some venues across the group. Um, there is a cost, you know, the more the more you go down the route of cameras and, and AI, it, it, it does build extra cost in. So you can only do it sometimes at the more higher volume uh, at venues and you have to make sure you're programming it in the way that you're capturing the right type type of food that's being wasted and the per kilo price of it to, to, to capture that wholesale. But I agree technology is important, but I don't want it to be an excuse as to why people aren't recording it if, if it hasn't been rolled out. So even just a basic amount of saying, well, look, categorize your waste into three or four streams, you know, your your fruit, veg, your meat, your, meat, your dairy, uh, your carbohydrates. And at least if we've got a per kilo measurement of that on a weekly by week basis, then then we have a baseline to work from. Now we just took a deep dive into to, to food waste. That's <clears throat> one element of it. What else are you looking at as a company when it comes to uh, improving your impact and be sociable, responsible? Well, look, ultimately, our scope three emissions, our supply chain, if you like, is, the, is, is by far the biggest um, part of our carbon footprint as a company. Over 80% of our, of our emissions are related to our supply chain. So we can do, a, we can do, we can spend a load of time working on a load of other initiatives but if we don't crack that element um, we're going to fail um, and we do have a net zero ambition in the UK now um, to get to the, to get to 2030 as a net zero company so the biggest challenge we have is going right back through our through our supply chain and understanding okay where are the basics where you know are we buying British you know even simplicity of that British and seasonal in terms of fruit and vegetable 
that should be the gold standard where possible. Clearly, there are months months of the year where where that becomes harder. So we have to work with our chefs to understand. Okay, we've got into a system, a food system where it really is unsustainable if we think we can buy strawberries in December, if we think it's okay to air freight in asparagus in February. You know, it just we have to get back to core principles of good food grown as locally as possible that tastes great that is great value is supporting the local communities um, that we that we do business with and make sure that our chefs are highly educated as to ha- what's the best produce to serve and when going beyond that it goes you know meat has does have the highest carbon footprint that's that's unarguable that's what the science says i know there's people to the left and right of the argument that would say there's lots of gray areas but Per kilo, meat will always have the highest carbon footprint. So, so what can we do to reduce that? So we look at, okay, look, if you're buying a kilo of beef from from cattle that's been grazed in the Amazon rainforest basin that's been cleared to graze that cattle or to grow soybean to feed that cattle, clearly that's going to have a much higher impact on the on the environment than if we're supporting um, British herds who are who are in the main grazed outside on grass. Yes, they they are fed indoors to a certain degree in the winter, then proportionally that will have a lower carbon footprint. So let's try and source, again, British beef, British lamb, British chicken, but look at the welfare standards as well because the more intensively reared that animal, the more intensive that farm is, the more likely that it will have a higher carbon footprint because of the the feed that's gone into those animals as well as all of the you know, the antibiotics, the water use, the, the chemicals, the fertilizers, the pesticides, all of that has to be seen in the, in the round. And, and the, you know, the more and more I get into it, the more interested I get on the subject. Biodiversity is so key. Actually going back to nature and understanding that we are a key part of that food chain. And as a catering company of our size and scale, you know, we're, we're a major actor and we, we have a responsibility to engage with producers and farmers to help them have a profitable business as well, but actually make sure that they can make changes in how they are farming um, to be more, um, you know, in line with with the ideals we need to get our planet back on to an even keel. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because uh, it's also called rewilding land. And what we've done over years is that we actually deplenish our land. Uh, you, you will go some parts of the world, you will see farmland that is unusable because it's just been deplenished. Uh, because we just over over actually farmed it in a way. What about um, when we talk about education? Because I one of my own experiences as well is that you know it's people's lack of education, understanding what their food choices actually have impact both on you know local communities, but but the planet as well. Are you working a lot with that? You know, both internally, but also with your your suppliers and so on, with the educational part of it, because it all starts with you know a change of mind. Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge we had was was actually changing the thought process of the chefs that currently exist in our business because, you know, a lot of people have grown up um, in urban locations, in city centers where they've never, you know, they, they're used to their food turning up at the venue or in a supermarket, as I said, pre-portioned, pre-packed, available all year round, whenever you want it, how you want it. So actually taking some of our chefs to reconnect with 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 farms and the natural world is a really key and important point um you know we're teaching butchery skills back into our chef community because that's another element that's been stripped away um over the years that as we've as we've essentially gone to a more consumerist based purchasing system that you don't need butchery skills you don't need fishmongery skills how do we get that back in the talent pool how do we make sure that that's seen as a as an important step how do we how do we explain to our chefs about the carbon footprint? You know, I, very early on, I was talking to people about reducing our the amount of meat in our menus, and I remember one chef proudly telling me, "Okay, we've we've taken a lot of the red meat back, John. You know, we've gone a lot more plant forward, and there was avocados everywhere across the menu." And I'm like, "Okay, well, where do you th-? you know?" And we were in nor- you know the northern part of the UK, and I'm like, "Well, how how do you think that avocados?" got to your site you know where's it been grown how's it been transported probably chilled as it's been transported to, to then hit hit your venue and be put on the menu it's actually probably better if, if you use if you use more british beef than it is to is there is to fly in a load of avocado so it's that nuance of it's not there's not just one silver bullet of replace this with that it's a it's an overall education 
of the food system and how we can activate some changes within it. Yeah, and it's so interesting when you go into food and you start having all these elements of complexity, as you said, there's like transporting the food, there's like growing and farming the food, and then there's how we actually, you know, use the food and how we actually utilize it into the, you know, from nose to tail, as you talked about. And then uh, there's a quite interesting book uh, called No Planet B. I don't know if you read that yourself, John. I haven't read it. I've, I've, no, I, 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 I've, I've read sections of it. I haven't read the whole book. But yeah, I know the one you're referring to, yeah. But he, uh, he also talks about, you know, the biggest impact you can do if you want to save the world or the climate or the planet is actually, you know, looking at the way you consume food just as an individual as well because uh, that's the only way to to, to change the uh, climate change is that we get that under control and then we can start with all the higher you know the the luxury hygiene factors as he called them in the book and it's so interesting that actually in food we have a big responsibility as you said so uh, i can i can see you are you're very emerged into the subject because it is a very very complex subject and also if you have to operationalize it in a, in a in a fast moving environment as hospitality and catering is um what what about the customers uh, you said in the beginning it's something they demand are they starting to set uh, demands or requirements in contracts that you need to live up to certain things to be able to get them as clients and how is that landscape changing I think it's uh, from a from a client perspective when we bid for new business when we're talking to existing customers I'd say it's been a massive change over the last couple of years. I think when I, I've been in the industry about 20 years now, and I'd say for the first 10 years of, of that, of that, uh, you know, people would ask to see your CSR policy. They might ask, you know, do you recycle your coffee? You know, it was very small scale. It was, it was a, a, a tiny fraction of, 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 of an overall tender response or, or how they were measuring you as a, as a, as a, as a performing, as an operator. Now, I would say the last two or three big tenders we've done, it's been, if not the major topic of conversation, definitely in the top three items that they wanted to discuss. I would say, as in my company's approach to sustainability and technology would be the two biggest questions I now get asked by my customers right across the board. How, how can you guarantee as a business that you will stay ahead of the curve, that you are still delivering the right approach to both of those subjects in five years and 10 years time? I think most of my clients are looking at their own user groups and say, okay, it's a, it's, as I said, it's important to every demographic. I think it's especially important to the, to the younger demographic, 18 to 30 age group. And it doesn't take a genius to work out that your 18 to 30 age group will be your 30 to 45 age group in, in a decade's time and so on. So you've got to get it right now. You've got to engage. You've got to be seen as, as leading on these subjects rather than following actually by creating solutions that are different and are interesting um, that can involve some, some things that actually you can point to and say that's real. That we are, you know, we are we are creating new products like the the burger I talked about earlier that that demonstrate that there is a practical application of your sustainability agenda rather than just greenwash or, or you know having having some uh, policy in the cloud that that's very hard to nail down exactly what it is. I think in terms of customer demand, I think that's an interesting question because, and I would relate it to you know when we ask people do you, do you want to eat healthily nine out of 10 people would say, I want to eat healthily. When it comes to practice, um, they don't buy healthily. You know, they, there are venues and events because it's a treat. Um, so we can't just put salads on or, you know, wholesale approach of, you know, removing chips from our offers because that's the consumer demands that those products are there. So the trick I've got is I, I have to make food more sustainable but not necessarily shove it down people's throats and buy this, it's sustainable, buy this, it's green, buy, buy this because it has a low carbon footprint. The trick in my role and my organization's role is still to deliver amazing food that looks and tastes fantastic, has the textures, is still indulgent, still feels like a treat. But by the way, as a side impact, it is very sustainable um, and, it, and it is lowering the carbon footprint of our operation overall. Yeah, because I think there's, 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 most people also when they go out, if it's to a event or a restaurant, is for a treat. So it has to be tasted, it has to touch these uh, centers in our brain that we are we are having a, having a treat now. And I think you know most operator will be nodding as you're saying those statistic. You know when you ask them in, in a survey and what they go and do is two different things. It's always been like that. I can still remember when we uh, introduced salads when I worked at McDonald's way back. Um, and everybody thought the roof will go off 
uh they didn't you know it was like you know this thing down in the corner you did twice a day these salads it was not like the thousands of things because people don't go to mcdonald's to eat salad it's a different experience they, they they're going for there and i don't think that have changed it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have plant-based offerings but it's definitely still for that you know the treat uh, this is something i can't get at home often i say that's why i'm getting it here yeah exactly and i think it's just reframing what plant forward means i think a lot of people think oh that means you're going to take away my burger or my steak or my chicken and just put a plate of you know leeks or, or, <laughs> that i'm going to eat ultimately <laughs> what we're trying to do is say look you can still have your beef burger you can still have your chicken burger we might reduce the gram size of the actual animal protein i mean we've got a chicken katsu burger at the moment that we're trialing where we've reduced the amount of chicken to, to a four ounce portion and we've added an onion bhaji and we've added a load of salad and we've added more plant forward approach overall to the meal that you're still getting a chicken burger and you're still getting value but it's a different composition overall and that's that i believe is the way to solve the issue i think there will be a small proportion of people um who who, who are pure vegans or pure vegetarians and, and I know that's growing, but it's not growing quick enough to solve the issue. We're not suddenly going to have 100% veganism across the board. It's, it's just not going to happen. And I think we have to wake up to that fact and say, okay, how do we bring meat eaters on this journey without disenfranchising them, without making them feel that they, you know, that they feel guilty about, you know, their, their consumer behavior or their eating habits? And, and if we can do that in a way that's positive and proactive, I think then we can activate real change. We had a similar conversation, a strategy session a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the bell curve and said, if we really want to make a change, we need to move the, the, the extreme meat eaters a bit more towards replacing some of that meat with plant protein. And it's not about telling them they are wrong. It's actually just giving the better product than they're eating now. Much more tasty product actually that actually lives up to or is better to what they are consuming now, then they will move. It's not harder than that. People always go for the most delicious thing and stop actually putting, you know, you know, stickers on saying that, uh, you know, uh, become vegan or we are only for vegans because actually that's not going to move the majority of people, especially not in, in Northern Europe and, you know, hot gather gather societies as, as we come from. And I think also he talks about that in, in, in No Plan to Be as well, Mike, uh, Mike there, that there's, uh, there's actually about actually how can you entice people to make a movement instead of trying to actually make stigmas about it like we had with smokers as smokers as well at some point. And I don't think we, we got that totally right, that transformation. But I think we need to go give people a gentle journey so they actually you know buy into the, the concept. So so I like the idea about replacing, you know, uh, with other other proteins. Um what about um as we, we, we look forward and uh, you're, you're opening up again, what is your next big initiative when it comes to uh, these impactful thing uh, within uh, in Levy? Is there like one big thing coming around the corner when you are up and running and lights on again? Is there like one big thing you would like to, to see that you are stepping into and make some strides on when it comes to sustainability, impact, whatever it is? Yeah, I, 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 look, at the... The event that's on the horizon that, that we're all focused on at the moment and excited about is COP26, um, which is taking place in one of our venues in Glasgow, um, rescheduled from last year. So it's November this year, first two weeks in November 2021. And that's, that's sort of focused our minds, not just about how we cater at that event, because essentially that event is a, it's two weeks. You know, it's, we, we have obviously have to take, you know, take the principles that I've discussed into action and make sure that that's the most climate friendly event of that scale that's ever been delivered um, from a food and beverage perspective. And that's what we're committed to do. But more interesting for me is using that as a catalyst for change right across the Levy business and right across the Compass UK business. Because what what we're trying to do in, in composing those menus is, is to really demonstrate that there is no cliff edge decision for the consumer. They don't have to get to the point where they say, okay, I have to give up all meat, all dairy, all uh, yeah, I have to be a vegan from this point onwards. We've gone to the next level of saying, okay, we're in Scotland. We, we probably want to replace some of the animal protein with a different animal protein. So we've looked at venison, for example. Wild venison in the Scottish Highlands is quite destruct destructive for um, you know, the actual natural environment. You know, the, the deer are eating young saplings. The, the, the ecosystems actually get destroyed by deer being rampant across the Highlands. So 
culling or controlling that herd, the wild herd, is important for the ecosystem. Therefore, we don't want to waste that meat. So if we can then have venison burgers on our COP26 menus, as an example, that actually has a positive eco story as well as still allowing people to, to feel indulgent and have a treat. And that's the principle we're trying to go to right across the business. Take it to the next level of understanding of, of where we're at and how we can improve. I think we've got some really exciting projects uh, where we're actually talking to producers direct. We're talking to farmers about their land, about regenerative agriculture, about circular food systems, how we can grow some of our own food, how can we can educate um, our, our own teams and actually take them back into nature. We're talking to some of our larger venues about their overall net zero ambitions as well as a venue. And then we have a key part to play in that. So we're, we're being you know quite proactive in, in finding solutions for our clients. And I think that's really exciting because that's a different kind of conversation than we'd normally have as a, as a, as a caterer and client because we've become enmeshed um, you know, a little bit higher up the value chain because we're, we're, we're definitely um, being seen as a, as a wider player in, in the solutions that we can find. But ultimately, it's just going to be exciting to get back to doing what we love and getting back to full venues, having, you know, having fans hopefully in full attendance without social distancing when it's safe again to do so, and then engaging them again with the right product at the right price using the right technology. And I think seamlessly, um, you know, with the pent up demand that's out there, that will then grow into a brighter future for all of us. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's, 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 we can't, we can't wait to be able to go out. You know, one thing is going to a restaurant, but actually going out and actually experience events again. It's going to be, and going to to a football match with a full stadium. It's going to be uh, very, very good when we can do that. So taking it on from talking about sustainability, is talk a bit about but you as well, and it's very connected to sustainability, and we maybe actually can stay in that lane because I always like to ask the guest about what is their biggest learning or what is their biggest failure they done. And I know when you go out with a mission, as you do as the MD for, for Levy and want to actually to do something about sustainability and impact and so on, that's a complex matter. And you can only make mistake because there's so much, you know, complexity within it. Is there any, any learnings you can share from, from that journey where you say, I would definitely not do that again? Yeah. I mean, I think early doors a couple of years ago, we were probably a little bit too dogmatic about you know what should be on the menu and what shouldn't be that you know we'll ban these items or we'll absolutely cut this you know particular supply chain out and i think very early on i learned that we have to be more inclusive and take everyone on the journey if we're going to succeed um and 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 actually not not be not you know not ban anything or be dogmatic with our clients or our customers i think i think you're right there are going to be a lot of hurdles and difficulties ahead because it is such a complex issue and it's not you know every almost every food group you look into you find a different problem it's not like you can switch entirely you know people go okay well let's go you know you're telling people to eat less beef but there's an issue with rice and there is an issue with rice because a lot of methane came, comes off rice paddy fields so how do we deal with with with, uh, with with that knee-jerk reaction i think i come back to the principle that everyone should support which is, you know, buying British and supporting British producers and buying seasonally as our grandparents would have done and treating food with respect and making sure we don't waste anything. These are core fundamental principles that, you know, a couple of generations ago were just ingrained. That was just natural behavior that, you know, we, we didn't we, we didn't have these overly processed foods. We didn't have, you know, the kind of uh, issues that have been created particularly in the last couple of decades, you know, it's, it's an issue that, that's really ballooned and mushroomed um, in my lifetime. And I think what we're, what we're going to struggle with is, is convincing everyone in the, in the timeline that we've got, because if you listen, you know, and I'm a massive fan of Greta Thunberg. I think, you know, what she's done and the voice that she's created um, for, for, for environmental activism is amazing for someone so young and so clear minded. Um, but she's right. You know, we can't, there's no point, doing something small now we have to act now the science science tells us every action we take now in 2021 will reduce the impact over time and if we can't we haven't got another decade to put these issues off so we have to be brave we have to take some solid actions and yes mistakes will be made and i'm sure there'll be you know when you put yourself on a pedestal then there's plenty of people that want to knock you down um but as long as you do it with integrity and you have a moral purpose and you are generally doing it for a place of trying to make things better um, I, I hope that 
most people come on the journey and say, okay, well, you know, that leave you doing their best. We're not perfect. You know, we, we, we are absolutely not perfect. We're not a hundred percent accurate and, and, and delivering a hundred percent in terms of what we could do in terms of sustainability across the operation as we stand, but we have an ambition to get there. And I think that's the important thing. I think you said, you said a lot of interesting things. One thing, uh, actually my mom who is, uh, built her own hospitality business back in the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, and, and she said to me uh, a couple, probably five years ago, it feels a bit like we have lost the relationship with uh, with food. She said, like, well, people don't know what a good potato is anymore. And and she's absolutely right, uh, I believe. And I think also that's what you said as well. And I think that's what we all need to, to get back to. And I, I definitely believe that the, the pandemic and somehow brought people back to their own kitchens and they started to connect with, with with food again and now we need to connect the food with nature as well as you say so i just thought there was just a little bit of add-on i think that's so interesting actually it's also understanding what i'm eating right now does that come locally from what kind of journey has it been on that you know tin of tomatoes and so on and so on and so on when you start asking yourself these questions you you don't have to read much it's just common sense some of it but we lost some of that in the whole, you know, commercialization of the, of the food chain. It's so interesting. You talk about that, you know, it's not about being perfect. It's about making progress as well. I really like that. What about, um, it's, uh, is there any people that has been very influential to you on this journey into this? It's like, there's normally you mentioned greater Thunberg, which I totally agree with you. Very, and also, you know, the next generation that's going to be, you're buying stuff for us and she's very powerful and she's done something and other people as that you know inspires you to to go on this journey this huge mission and vision you have for this project and get you out of bed every day and trying to move the needle on it yeah i think look i've i've read a lot of background materials some science-based some more um you know theoretical i suppose i think the person that really got me got me thinking more deeply when i read his books was michael pollan um, the, the omnivores dilemma. Um, if anyone hasn't read that, I think that's an absolute essential read for anyone that's in food or hospitality or has an interest in food, um, because because he really dissects some of the issues. And he did it, and he, you know, and he did it in his previous in his second book on the subject, which was in defence of food, which essentially starts to look at why we've created some of these problems. And essentially, it's about the myth of convenience of of wanting everything to hand. At all times and how we've used artificial fertilizers and the growth of intensive farming and this has all happened really in the last 50 years you know and and the issues that have ballooned in those 50 years he traces it right back to okay if we could just reset the dial slightly and look at our food in a slightly different way we could we could make some changes and some impacts and it's just really you know his his, because he's not a chef and he's not necessarily environmentalist, but he is he is a big thinker about food. Um, and I think he writes in a really um, effective way as to how we should change our behaviors. And he, and he definitely ch- changed my mind on a few things. This book, I mean, I know we're on audio. We are the weather. Um, Jonathan Safran Troy. I think he's he's interesting because I read his novels as a kid. Um, well, when as a younger adult, I should say he's not that old. Um, but uh, and he was a novelist, and I used to love his novels. Uh, and then he's turned more into a, an activist, an environmental activist, and he wrote a fairly hard hitting book about industrial um, farming, I suppose, or, 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 or why we should eat less meat. But this book is more about um, the actual crisis that we've got in terms of climate change. Um, and there's a lot of facts in that book, you know, and he goes through sections of that book where it is just hard hitting facts about, you know, the death of coral reefs, um, you know, in the next 20 to 30 years that we cannot do anything about now. It's already in train. It's already in process. They're 99% certain that we will see the die off of all coral reefs in our lifetime, which is just shocking and horrific in itself, especially when you consider that a quarter of marine life lives either in or around coral reefs. You know, so what the hell are we going to do about that? don't know Uh, but putting that aside he also talks about the philosophy and the change of behavior of humanity and i think where it's really interesting where he talks about knowing there's a problem and believing there's a problem and i think as a human as a human race we all know there's a problem we all know that the world's getting warmer we all know that we're experiencing um, more extreme weather events we all know that probably we're going to see more and more crop failures we're going to see more and more uh, displacement of people around the globe especially in the developing world 
We know that. We can reel off a lot of the statistics. We can reel off a lot of the data. But how many of us actually believe it? Because we're very bad as a human race as, as reacting to a problem that will only, the true horror of which we probably won't face into for another 20 or 30 years when it's far, far too late. Now, if there was, and we've, and we've seen in the pandemic where there was an issue that actually forced us to collectively across nations as a human race, try and figure out a solution for, because it was affecting us right now. It was like a meteor coming at the earth. We had to find a solution or we were going to see complete devastation of people's health and people and the economies around the world. And we find a vaccine in a miracle time, uh, multiple vaccines actually in miracle time within the first 12 months. And most countries are now rolling out a vaccine plan and we are seeing the tide being turned. Now, We've known about climate change for at least 30 years, probably 50. Um, if you go right back to some of the early reports that were coming out of the US in the 50s and 60s, and yet we, we have singly failed to address it as a crisis. We address it as, as someone else's problem down the line. And that is the biggest failing that Jonathan talks about in the book, that knowing and believing are two very different things. And the more we shift into the believe mode, as in, it is our problem. We have to do something about it now. If we leave it another 5, 10, 15 years, it's far too late when we're looking at three, four degrees of warming above post-industrial levels where the future of my children, and this is what drives me. I've got two young daughters, their future, their children's future, you know, that they, they, whatever actions they take in 50 or 60 years' time, it will almost be superfluous. The, 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 the actions we take now of our generation we're the people that you know are controlling companies or have an interest, politicians, real leaders across industry. It's our duty to stand up now and actually try and show a positive way out of the crisis that we're in. Yeah, and uh, I love you mentioned uh, Michael Pollan. He was probably also the first book I ever wrote, uh, read about about this uh, this uh, issue, and it made me really think about what I did as an individual. We also talk about what organizations can do, but you as an individual can do something three times a day, day because you eat three times a day, and you can actually you know make conscious choices three times a day. That doesn't mean that you need to be extreme in any way. You just need to rethink the way you consume things and also buy more locally if possible and start supporting that. So, uh, and I think that's the brilliant thing by Michael Bolland. He make it very, you know, practical for an individual will. And if you don't want to read the books, there's a great, uh, I don't know if it's still available on Netflix, uh, but it's a great program where he actually refers to some of this as well. A great educational series on him on, on food and where he talks about fire, earth and wind and rain and so on and how we are impacting that. That's definitely still on Netflix. Uh, yeah, that's definitely there. And and in defense of food, he made a PBS documentary and I think that is available either on Amazon or, or Netflix as well. Good. So you confirmed that. What about, um, and I guess we already talked about books and which one you, which one would you always give away? Of all, you mentioned a lot of books uh, uh, and they're all great books, but what, what is the number one book to give away? I think The Omnivore's Dilemma is, is for me, the book that I would go back to and reread. And if no one, if you haven't read anything on the subject, that would be the one that, that, that captures, captures everything. Cause he looks at, a, he looks at an industrial farm. He looks at an organic farm. He looks at essentially being a hunter gatherer. He looks at the whole system behind it. There's some really amazing stats. And, you know, for example, about the corn industry in the U S you know, when you go into what most of that corn is grown for, how the corn developed as a plant over the centuries, um, you know, just facts that I, I'd never even uh, known and it just blew my mind. I think it's, a, it's hugely interesting, well-written and, and very timely. Great, great, great. Yeah. John, is there any other companies you've been inspired by in your pursuit as the MD making this change? Is there anyone you've been looking at and said, okay, well, we can definitely learn from what they are doing and, and implementing some of that in our company? Is there anyone you could mention here on the show to go and look at as well? We look at our supply chain, as, as I said earlier, that's our biggest carbon footprint. So working with suppliers who are being more proactive or even carbon neutral themselves, I think is is hugely inspirational. And that, and that makes the journey even simpler if your suppliers themselves are already implementing the same sort of principles and philosophies. So we there's a handful, I mean, and we talk to our client groups about some of these products as well now. So Toast, um, I always talk about Toast because they, they brew beer. Um, from from waste bread or bread, you know, there's a huge issue in bakeries. 
industrial bakeries in terms of baking to demand and knowing what the demand from the supermarkets will be or the or the wholesale markets so there's always a surplus of bread in the system so toast actually take that surplus bread and use it to ferment and brew new beer and they've got a great range of beer um, so we talk to rob one of the co-founders there a lot and he talks to our client base and we're trying to promote his products at a number of our venues at the moment and he's got quite you know he's got really exciting collaborations with other breweries as well um, that's coming soon this year which you should keep your eye out for and, and i think that's a really um you know it's it's, it's, a, it's a way of activating interest and change um, we've been working with a company called rubies in the rubble um, for a while as compass uh, uk um, they they for example make a tomato ketchup that is one made using tomatoes again that would have been wasted because an awful lot of fruit and veg doesn't make it onto our shelves because it doesn't look right um, it doesn't look perfect. Um, so it either gets wasted or turned into animal feed. So they take tomatoes that don't look good enough for a consumer to buy and turn them into tomato ketchup. But what they also do is they swap out the refined sugar element of ketchup. And if you ever look at the ingredients of a normal ketchup, I won't say the brand, you'll see it has an awful lot of refined sugar in it. Um, so they take, they take that element and replace it with pears. So the natural sweetness of pears replaces the sugar still sugar but it's natural fruit sugar from a from an actual real thing um and that and that that product i think is really really great um and 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 sings out we've looked at um uh, we've looked at a soft drink range there's a company in south wales called flawson drinks and they they make great soft drinks that we tasted last week with some of our clients um like apple juices um, pear juices sparkling and that again is all made made through fruit that would have been wasted um, so again, circular economy, carbon neutral, um, Dash is quite a big brand now as well, where they're using, um, surplus fruit to make flavored sparkling water. So we're, we're trying to push that, uh, nurture brands, uh, again, a great portfolio of brands where they, they're a carbon neutral company and they have snack bars. Um, and Emily's crisps is one of their brands. So they're actually real vegetables that have been uh, baked so they, they taste great so they might be like french beans instead of eating a crisp so it's again the other side of this argument is actually a healthier diet for you as a person is better for the planet as well healthier planet is, is is a healthier you so we're trying to we're trying to use snacks and more retail products that are in line with those principles as well and they're, they're just a handful there's so many companies out there doing amazing things that they're already b corps or they're carbon neutral or they're donating some of their profits back to um, back to the planet, or, or initiatives to to grow a more sustainable future. So, as a company, because we we're so big and we have such high volume, if we can help those companies grow and develop and, and incubate some of that talent within our supply chain, I think that's that will be a great out outcome as well. Great, great, great. Um, as we are, we we already touched on that hospitality is reopening. You talked about activities happening on your side. The next 12 to 18 months, if you had a crystal ball, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, because it's been, you know, I, I don't think anyone can ever think about uh, as long as hospitality has been an industry per se and the restaurants started out, ever been a crisis like this before. Uh, and I, I don't think there's one thing we can't say that is not a challenge, you know. Um, but how it's going to look and, and how do you think it all going to pan out? Yeah, look, this is the question everyone's asking across the industry at the moment. You know, what what does the future look like? And look, first of all, no one's been through a global pandemic that shut the entire industry for over a year. So, so the truth is, no one really knows, and anything I say could be completely uh, could be completely false. Um, but ultimately, all I can say is, I firmly believe what the pandemic has told us is the need to connect is still there. The need to be at live experiences. And hospitality plays a huge part in that is definitely still there as human beings we're social animals we love being in social settings we love talking we love um, being entertained we love being out in the wider world and we've all had to constrain uh, that or, or completely stop it for the last year so i think there is a huge pent-up demand and when people feel safe again and i think the vaccination numbers in the uk certainly are allowing people to feel that way I think it will turn pretty quickly. I don't. I think live experiences will turn back on uh, and come back really, really strongly. Um, I think the spend patterns. Look, I think there's definitely a there's there's, there's pent up demand, so there's pent up spend. Um, now, whether that's sustained over a long period of time or whether that's going to be a short term rush uh, that will tail off after six months, 
I, I, in truth, I don't know. I think all we have to plan on is is delivering and executing amazing experiences to make sure that people remember what they've missed um, and really value that again um, and reconnect um, in social settings, which I, I think from this week onwards, we're going to see more and more of. Um, the long-term economic effect of this pandemic, um, which I think on a macro level, you know, that, that'll be the question for hospitality. It's, we've usually been a pretty resilient industry in recessions. You still have to eat. People still like to treat themselves. It might just be that they're treating themselves once a month instead of twice a month. But, you know, I think we'll, we'll see how that pans out. We're all hopeful of a strong recovery. And if we do it in the right way with purpose at the heart of that recovery, I think people will, will, will value that more and will, will actually enjoy their experiences more. Great. So, so, so a lot of optimism there from you, John. Uh, what about, about yourself as the, the MD, you know, leader of a big organization? How, how have you, you know, how do you, because a lot of people, like a lot of leaders have asked during this pandemic, they've changed the way they prepare themselves for every day because suddenly it's demanding on a different level. And on top of that, you are very ambitious with uh, creating sustainability impact throughout your business. How do you show up pro every day? What is the, your secret ingredients we all have our secret things we do well I, uh, i'm not sure i do show up pro every day michael i think you probably give me too much credit but um I, I do my best i think i think ultimately you know this pandemic has been mentally really tough for everyone i think that's the mental side has been hard because you know certainly at the start of it you doubt yourself you've got to make some pretty quick decisions that impact on people's lives um before the furlough system was announced in the uk that was the toughest point where you are looking at you know thousands of people's careers and livelihoods and, and and trying to do the best by those people was the was was the thing that we faced into pretty early and i and i think in the main we got it right we support people we repurpose people we try to find people other job opportunities across the group and it was pretty successful in doing that i think coming out of the pandemic we then switch more into event mode again which is probably more physically exhausting rather than and than mentally exhausting but it, it's a nicer problem to have. I think getting out there and reconnecting with people that you haven't seen over a year, you know, when I was at, at one of our venues last week, seeing people again for the first time in that environment for a year was just amazing because the people were genuinely happy to be there and be back working in that environment. There was there was just an outpouring of, of, of happiness and love to be back doing what they what, what, what truly as an events professional that you want to be doing you want to be at high volume events you want to be serving customers in a high pressured situation and i think that's that's staying focused on that 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 is our true purpose that's what we're here for to, to provide those amazing experiences and to do it in the right way is is what is what keeps me focused ultimately i'm just one person yes i'm i'm the md but if i haven't got good people around me um, then we're nothing as a company. So we, we, we made sure we've, we've reinvested in some great people. We've restructured to make sure that we've got strong um, support networks right across the business. And, you know, we are going to grow back really strongly. I think there is going to be pressures across hospitality, of course. There was pressures because of Brexit. You know, less people were coming from Europe to work in the UK even before the pandemic. The pandemic has caused more and more people to drift into other industries, either you know, a lot of people have gone to be delivery drivers for Amazon, for example. So, you know, are these people all going to come back to hospitality? Probably not. So it's down to us to make sure that we are the employer of choice, that we deliver the best experience when they're here, the best training, the best learning, the best development, you know, ideally a very competitive pay rate and benefit structure, and that they feel like they're part of a family. And that's the culture we're trying to create, that they, they when, when you join Levy, you understand what our core principles are, you understand what we're trying to achieve and that we all work together to, to get to that end, end goal. And then that's, uh, you know, you mentioned a, a very big challenge, the staffing staffing crisis. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I guess that's one of the challenges as any leader in hospitality has had right now. How do I actually get, you know, enough people to do the job? With that in mind, and then what, what top three advice would you give to leaders out there? It's always uh, the question I ask uh, in the end of the conversation to people. Um, what, what is your what is your top top advice for them? Well, the the only advice I give is the is the is the three, I suppose the three things that have served me well over the twenty odd years um, that I've been in the industry. I think integrity is the first one. I mean, it's if you've got integrity, then you get a lot more respect back from your customers, your clients, and everyone that works for you. They may not always agree with you. 
but at least they know what you stand for um and and that you, you know every day isn't 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 suddenly a a 90 degree swerve in a different direction have have a purpose and have integrity and, and stick to what you believe in and drive that way uh, i think secondly uh, kindness is is underrated and as i've got older um and probably a little bit a bit a little bit less uh arrogant a little bit less uh, antagonistic in some of the conversations i've had in my time i've realized that kindness is is the greatest virtue and it costs nothing to be kind as the old saying goes so even if you don't agree with someone even if you don't particularly like someone you can still be kind to them and try and, and try and walk a few meters in their shoes and see things from their perspective and make sure you try and come to a compromise that's that's best for both parties because aggression and antagonism definitely results you know in in negativity for both parties 99 percent of the time uh, and then finally um again bravery i think is underrated i think some of the career choices um some of the ambitions i've had in my career i've always been amazingly supported by my wife and we talk about things and louise always says look as long as you're doing something you believe in be brave and and continue to do it that way and i think ultimately what's the worst that can happen if I've done it with integrity and pride and kindness, I'll back myself. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show and sharing your uh, knowledge about sustainability, impact, how the, the future of hospitality would look and all the other great advice you gave. I send you and the team uh, all the power and energy you will need uh, in, in the time ahead. And, and I'm sure we will connect at some point in the near future talking about impact where you're gone with sustainability there's there's so much else to dive into in that in, in the coming years thank you michael thank you so much john for your amazing insights on how to build a more sustainable company and get started on the journey if you want to learn more about how to make your business more sustainable check out episode number 45 the power of ai technology and food waste with Mark Sorns, who is the co-founder of Winnow. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. Right now, together with Biz Simply, we are conducting a survey with the aim to collect best practices on how leaders in the industry are transforming their organization so they can deliver the experience both employees and customers are demanding. Please participate via the link in the show notes. A big thank you to BizSimply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at BizSimply.com or on their social at BizSimply or BizSimplyHQ. You can always email them directly on advice at BizSimply.com. Also, a big thank you to Fina Charlson, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time. For another interview, and in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. Thank you, and be maverick.